Today is an exciting turning point in this podcast. We are finally getting ready to jump into Mormon's actual abridgment portion of the Book of Mormon. For the last several lessons, we've been going through the words of Nephi, the words of Jacob, and the Isaiah chapters that they included. But now we're going to actually be beginning the part that Mormon abridged very specifically for our day. What I want to do is take a pause and get into Mormon's head. What was he thinking? Why did he even write this abridgment the way that he did? And who was he? So we can get into Mormon's thought process and figure out, okay, what should we be looking for in these parallels? And why did Mormon include the things that he did the way that he did? So let's start off by talking a little bit about who even was Mormon. Mormon was one of the greatest prophets and kings to live in the history of our earth. Now, of course, originally Mormon's abridgment had the book of Lehi in it. So if we had been reading the book of Mormon before the whole fiasco with the last 116 pages, uh, we would have opened the book of Mormon and it would have been the book of Lehi that Mormon very carefully and specifically abridged for us. Unfortunately, that was lost. So for us, Mormon's abridgment begins with the words of Mormon and really specifically with the book of Mosiah. And that is where we're getting ready to start. So let's start off by talking a little bit about who even was Mormon. Mormon was one of the greatest prophets and kings to ever live in the history of our earth. Now, when I say kings, of course, what I mean is in a heavenly sense, a priesthood leader, one of our patriarchal fathers, that was Mormon. And today, as we've talked about in previous lessons and increasingly you can see it everywhere, Mormon's character and his credibility is under attack. Some say that Mormon was this genocidal war general who committed war crimes or that maybe he was biased. You know, why did he stick all those war chapters in the Book of Mormon? Well, he was just biased towards war. And so we've got to be careful and take what he says with a grain of salt. But who was Mormon really? Let's remember who he was. This is the man who was trusted at 10 years years old with knowledge of the hidden location of the entire Nephite historical record. Remember, Amaron comes to Mormon. He's only a 10-year-old little kid. And he says, Mormon, I've been watching you. You are a sober child and you are quick to observe. I'm going to tell you where the entire Nephite historical record is hidden. And at 24 years old, I want you to go and I want you to be the final witness, the final recorder of these last days of the Nephite civilization. That's Mormon at 10, okay? Five years later, when Mormon's only a 15-year-old teenager, Jesus Christ comes to him. He begins speaking with Jesus Christ. He says he was visited. He began to know of the goodness of Jesus. And he's inspired so much with knowing who God is and this personal communication that he has with Jesus Christ that he begins wanting to go preach to the Nephites and, and spread the message. And the Lord tells him, close your mouth, Mormon. You know too much. They do not want to hear. Do not speak. Do not teach them. Um, at the same time, Again, this is when Mormon is 15 years old. It says in the Book of Mormon when he was in his 16th year, um, 15, then he actually gets entrusted with commanding the entire Nephite army. He's at the top. Which if you think about that, who was Mormon? What was his military skill, his influence working with men far older than him, um, his training, his competence, his ability for strategy that he gets trusted by all of these Nephites. They say, Mormon, you're the one we want to put in charge of the entire Nephite army. Okay, this, this is Mormon. This is the man who's writing the words that you are about to start reading. And of course, at 24 years old, about nine years later, he goes to the hill that Amaron told him about, and he begins abridging the Nephite records and recording and performing that part of his mission. 
Mormon is very specific at least twice in the Book of Mormon record about his lineage and who he was in terms of his blood. He was of royal blood. He points out once, he says, I am Mormon. I am a descendant of Nephi. You can tell he's very proud of that. But then in another place, he says specifically, he says, I am Mormon and a pure descendant of Lehi. And if you study that word pure, especially um, in the context of declaring lineage, um, what he's essentially saying here is that he's not only a descendant of Lehi, but that bloodline has remained pure. He's of the really kind of the royal, the patriarchal, the, the inheritance line for inheriting the priesthood and, and the lineage and the blessings and the covenants, which makes sense then why Mormon of all people would be entrusted with really being the father of all the Book of Mormon fathers. He is the one who is their voice to all of us in the last days, and he gets entrusted with writing the Book of Mormon. Now, why was Mormon being tasked with writing the Book of Mormon in the first place? Why was he not just going to record the last days of the Nephite people and all of those records, you know, the records of Alma, the plates of Nephi? Why, why weren't we just given those? Why were we specifically given Mormon's abridgment? Now, funny enough, to answer this question, I actually want to go into the Old Testament, into the book of Ezekiel. And as just a little backstory on this passage, really a, a little backstory to this podcast, it was in the end of 2022, I was really seriously praying about what to do with a certain situation for someone that I was trying to help uh, who was struggling. And as I was watching just the different things they were trying to work through and trying to help them, and at the same time, just feeling a little bit weighed down by what is going on in the world today and just feeling like, we have such a mess. How do we fix this? Um, there has to be a way. What's the solution? How is God going to turn this around? Not in a general way. I, I know the general answers. I, I know the scriptures, but more specifically, like what, what's actually the solution? And I was very specifically prompted one day to go and read Ezekiel 37. And as I was reading this chapter, I just felt like I could start to relate with Ezekiel so much. So Ezekiel 37 opens up where Ezekiel is speaking with the Lord and the Lord shows him a vision. Now you have to remember Ezekiel, he's right after Jeremiah. Some actually speculate that maybe Ezekiel was Jeremiah's son. So he's just a little bit after Lehi. This is around Lehi's time period. And Ezekiel has this vision where the Lord shows him this valley full of bones. They're dead. They're very, very dry, the chapter says. And these bones are actually symbolic of the house of Israel, specifically in the last days. It's dead. It's completely dry. It looks like there's no hope. And the Lord actually speaks to Ezekiel and he says, son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's response to the Lord is, he says, oh, Lord God, thou knowest, which I take a little bit to mean Ezekiel's looking at it saying, you know what? It looks pretty hopeless to me, but you know the answer. Is there any hope here? And the Lord says, Ezekiel, here's the solution. He says, prophesy to these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. In other words, Israel is dead. So he says, if you want to revive Israel in the last days, Give them the word of the Lord and speak it to them. Teach them the scriptures. And Ezekiel does this. This is in verse 7. He says, I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, a shaking. The bones came together, bone to his bone. It's really, he's seeing a literal resurrection before him. And not only the bones come together, but he says the sinews and the flesh comes upon them. And suddenly there's a body there, but the body's not alive. So the people, they're, they're kind of coming together. They're starting to, wow, okay, Israel's being gathered, but there's no life. There's no passion. They're, the power is missing. 
And so the Lord tells Ezekiel, he says, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, say to the wind, thus saith the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, breathe upon the slain that they may live. So Ezekiel prophesies, and of course, the wind is a symbol of the spirit and, and different things that we won't get into here. But he basically, breath comes into them and it says they lived, they stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Now remember, as I'm reading this chapter, what was the question on my mind? I felt like I had the same question as Ezekiel where I'm looking at this and I'm saying, God, how do we not just gather Israel? How do we not just bring all of us together, but how do we breathe life into us? How do we get our power back? How do we make a difference and change the world instead of feeling like we're almost constantly just trying to survive? And the Lord's like, here's the solution, Ezekiel 37. So the Lord says to Ezekiel, this is in verse 11, he says, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And they say, in other words, Israel in the last days, they're saying, our bones are dried, our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. In other words, Israel herself is feeling all of us. This is us in the last days. This is our day. We're saying our hope is lost. We're dead. Um, everything's over. And the Lord is saying, no, I will open your graves. I will cause you to come up out of your graves. I will bring you into the land of Israel. In other words, you feel dead. You look dead. You kind of are dead, but let's bring life back into you. Let's resurrect you as a people. He says, I will put my spirit in you and ye shall live. I will place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Now, as I was reading this chapter, I was really feeling the power of what Ezekiel was seeing. I'm seeing not just that, oh, you know, Israel's going to come together, but they're going to be an exceeding great army, an army for the Lord. They're going to be resurrected. They're going to have that power again. And so I could see, okay, great. Yes, this is going to happen, but how? And Ezekiel gives us that answer. The word of the Lord comes to him saying, Thou son of man, take thee one stick and ride upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Now, what is this stick? Um, scholars and people far wiser than I could talk about this, but essentially my understanding is it's a symbol of a covenant. It's a symbol of scripture. It's a symbol of who Israel is. It's essentially a symbol of the Bible. It's the covenant of Judah. We're going to read some quotes from prophets in a minute uh, that verify that, but the stick of Judah is the Bible. It's And it's not just the Bible, but it's also the children of Judah. It's the people and their covenants and who they represent as a family. So Ezekiel is told by the Lord to take Judah. And then he says, take another stick for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, and bring them together. Join them one to another in one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. In other words, if you want Israel to be restored again, and not just, oh, we know who we are, or we know the gospel, but if you want the power to be there, you're going to have to unite Judah and Joseph together. You're going to have to bring the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the bloodlines and the people united together once again. The Lord says, say unto them, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah and make them one stick and they shall be one in thine hand. And then the Lord says, when you do this, when you figure out how to unite the Bible and the Book of Mormon together and the people of Judah and the people of Joseph together, he says, that is when they are going to flock. They're going to flee. They're going to come out from their lands among the heathen where they are scattered. He says, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone and will gather them on every side and will bring them into their own land. And not only will they be gathered into their land, but they will become one nation upon the mountains of Israel. One king shall be king to them all. They will be no more two nations. They will not be divided, but they will become that nation again. Now, we understand from presidents of the church that this prophecy about this stick of Ephraim and the stick of Judah is the Bible and the Book of Mormon. This is what Brigham Young said, quote, the Old and New Testaments are the stick of Judah. You recollect that the tribe of Judah tarried in Jerusalem and the Lord blessed Judah and the result was the writings of the Old and New Testaments. But where is the stick of Joseph? Can you tell where it is? 
Yes, it was the children of Joseph who came across the waters to this continent, and this land was filled with people. And the Book of Mormon, or the Stick of Joseph, contains their writings, and they are in the hands of Ephraim. Where are the Ephraimites? They are mixed through all the nations of the earth. God is calling upon them to gather out, and he is uniting them, and they are giving the gospel to the whole world, end quote. Now, I want you to think about this. How do you unite Judah and the Book of Mormon? How do you do more than just, oh, we need to give Judah the Book of Mormon? You know, we, we understand this concept. We take the Book of Mormon to the world. People become converted. They come into the covenant. They partake of the ordinances. They find out who they are. And that's great. But we're still missing that power. What is it about the Book of Mormon that would cause a Jew or an Ephraimite or someone from Gad or Asher or Naphtali, any of these tribes to say, guys, let's build the nation again. And not just let's build it, but let's come together and God actually blesses them to become a mighty people, a nation once again with power where there is one king ruling over them. This has not happened yet, but the Lord says, if you will unite the Bible and the Book of Mormon, if you bring those tribes together, this will happen. So this is something that I have pondered and pondered and pondered about. How do you unite the two together? Does it mean teaching them together? Does it mean um, including the Bible in our conversations? Does it mean making sure we focus on the Book of Mormon? What is it? What is the solution? How do we get Israel to unite, gather, and arise and become this great army? The answer is found through Mormon. So let's talk for just a minute about birthrights and the birthright son. Who were Joseph and Judah in the first place? If we're talking about uniting these two groups, who were they? Well, you have to remember that the original Joseph, Joseph of Egypt and Judah, were brothers. They had the same father who was Jacob. Jacob's name was also Israel. Now, Israel was Abraham's grandson. Remember Abraham, right? Abraham is the one he's born in an awful situation. His father tries to kill him. And so he goes back. He says, I've got to abandon this culture that I grew up in. I don't want this. I don't want who I am. I want something different. And so he goes back to the fathers to get the covenants and he kills himself his entire life to sacrifice, to come into God's presence and receive promises from God. He receives those promises. God promises him, Abraham, because of your faith, your children are going to get access to baptism, to celestial marriage, to temporal land. They're actually going to get a land inheritance. In other words, they are going to have the opportunity to become like God, to not just be saved, but to actually become like Jesus Christ and become like the Father. And so Abraham passes this mission, really, and this covenant to his son, Isaac. And then Isaac passes it to Jacob. But Jacob actually goes a step further. Jacob tells his son, Joseph, in his blessing in Genesis 49, he says, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, end quote. Now, what does he mean, the everlasting hills? Where are the everlasting hills? What are they? Well, notice that word everlasting. You ever heard of the everlasting covenant? Yes, they're connected. So the everlasting covenant is the covenant of Adam and the covenant of Enoch and these this patriarchal and Melchizedek priesthood covenant begins with Adam. Adam and Eve, they're living in in Missouri, as we understand from prophets. The Garden of Eden was in Jackson County, Missouri. They get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They go to Adam on Dayamin, and Adam sets up a righteous kingdom there. We read about this in the Doctrine and Covenants and in the Book of Moses. So Adam sets up this kingdom, but his kids stray. But he keeps working, and he's trying to be patient with them as he's trying to help them come back into God's presence. This is what all righteous fathers do. It's all about the father comes into God's presence and not just, oh, you know, some, a few prophets out there. This is supposed to be the mission of every Melchizedek priesthood father. This is what it means to actually have the Melchizedek priesthood. The father overcomes the world. He's redeemed. He comes into the presence of God and then he helps his children. So this is Adam's mission, Seth's mission, Jared's mission. Um, down the line of these fathers, we get to Enoch. Enoch succeeds. Enoch actually 
builds the city of holiness, which is called Zion. Zion means city of holiness, and it's a real city. It's not just something Enoch imagined in his mind or had a dream about that one day would happen some day in the millennium, but it actually happens. He builds a city, and the people live there, and they live God's laws, and that city is eventually translated. But the sad thing about Enoch's great victory is that he has a vision where he knows that the rest of the people on the earth are rejecting the gospel and they're going to become so wicked that they're wiped out with a worldwide flood, right? This is the story of Noah. They're going to be destroyed. But Enoch receives a promise. Remember this concept. Righteous fathers receive promises from God. And so Enoch is one of them and Enoch receives a promise, but his promises are absolutely incredible. He's promised that Jesus Christ is going to come through his loins. He's promised that if his children will keep the commandments for thousands of years in the future, if those children will look back and look to the fathers and listen to them, all heaven will fight for them and Zion will be established. This is in Moses 7 and the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 9. Funny enough, this whole history with Enoch and everything is part that was cut out of the Bible during the Dark Ages and during the apostasy, And but Joseph Smith starts restoring it. And that's why we have to turn back to the Joseph Smith translation. And the Joseph Smith translation is critical. So in JST Genesis 9, we learn that Noah is a descendant of Enoch and he's he renews these covenants and he renews these promises and a sign that this covenant is being established and renewed with him is the rainbow. Now, sometimes when we look at the rainbow, we think, oh yes, it's a sign that the earth will never be flooded again. But if you actually get into scripture, there is a whole lot more than that. We're totally missing the meaning of the rainbow. In JST Genesis 9, it says, and the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it. This is God speaking that I may remember what the everlasting covenant. In other words, the rainbow is there as a sign that there is an everlasting covenant, a patriarchal priesthood Melchizedek covenant made with fathers, and it will never be broken or altered. A covenant that was made with Enoch says, which I made unto thy father Enoch. And this is what the covenant is, that when men should keep all my commandments, Zion should again come on the earth, the city of Enoch, which I have caught up unto myself. This is mine everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then Zion will look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy." This completely changes the way you look at a rainbow the next time there is a storm. That rainbow is a symbol of Enoch. That rainbow is a symbol of Zion and a symbol of fathers who received promises that all their children have to do is look up. All they have to do is turn back and listen to these fathers and keep the commandments. And then you know what will happen? Those fathers, all of Zion, all of heaven will fight for them, will shout with gladness, and Zion will be established. He says, the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven, possess the earth, and shall have place until the end come. This is my everlasting covenant, which I made with thy father Enoch, end quote. Now, a beautiful symbol of this covenant is also the Star of David. Sometimes we associate the Star of David with Jews and Judah. And while they definitely use that symbol today, if you actually study the history of that symbol, it's not a exclusively Jewish symbol. Um, It's known as the Seal of David. We know that it was in Jerusalem, but it was actually on cathedrals. It was actually associated with Christianity uh, during the medieval period. And it wasn't until more recent times that it became specifically associated with Jews and synagogues. Well, if you look at the Star of David and you ask yourself, what does this symbol mean? What do you see? You see a triangle pointing up and you see a triangle pointing down. Now go back to JST Genesis 9. What do we know? What is the symbol of the everlasting covenant? Children looking up 
and then fathers looking down. And when that happens, when the children look up and the fathers look down, they come together. They are unified. This is what Abraham did. Abraham was in a horrible situation, but he looked up. And what happened? The fathers looked down, they blessed him, and the entire history of the world changed. Same thing with Melchizedek. If you go read about Melchizedek in the Joseph Smith translation as well, incredible man. As a child, he's stopping the mouths of lions. He's walking through fire. He's fighting armies. These are real men. You want to talk about incredible masculine men? These are the fathers. These are the guys to look back to. Uh, They weren't a bunch of old men with beards wandering around in the desert. These are men that defy any kind of Hollywood movie star out there. And so these are these fathers that we are commanded to look up to. I believe this is why the early pioneers put the Star of David on the assembly hall in Salt Lake City. Right next to the Salt Lake Temple, they have the assembly hall. And what do you see right there? Right above the door, you see the Star of David because it's a symbol. Everlasting Covenant, Enoch, and we are children looking up and looking back to the fathers so that power can be restored, so that Israel can become a nation again. Now let's get back to Ezekiel. Let's get back to Mormon and the Book of Mormon. What does any of this have to do with the Book of Mormon, right? Well, Jacob, who is Abraham's grandson, is promised that he can have all of this, that he can have Enoch's covenant. It's sealed on him. He is so righteous that he gets territory in Enoch's land, in Adam's land, the land of the everlasting covenant, America. And he passes that special, special birthright to his son, Joseph, because Joseph was chosen as the birthright son because of his faith and because of his submission, not because he was just some isolated favorite or Jacob loved him more than all the other kids, but because he was the one who was the most righteous. He was the one that could be trusted. He is the one who submitted and listened to his father. Now, this whole concept of a birthright son is actually part of righteous family order in God's kingdom. And we have to understand this if we're going to understand the Book of Mormon and why the Book of Mormon has to be linked with Judah, because otherwise we're completely disconnected and we don't know what we're reading. So in God's family order, we've talked about this ad nauseum, but there's righteous fathers that come into God's presence, right? And they they want to save their children and they want to help their children. But fathers cannot do this alone. They can't. If they try to do it alone, they will fail. So righteous patriarchal fathers in the priesthood who are living the priesthood order, they choose a birthright son to help them carry on the legacy and save the family, carry on the covenant, carry on the promises, the blessings from God, and help their siblings come into that covenant and follow the father. So this father and his birthright son really work as a team. The ultimate example of this is God the Father and Jesus Christ. This is a quote from Brigham Young. He said, quote, The oldest son has always had the privilege of being ordained, appointed, and called to be the heir of the family if he does not rebel against the father. And he is the savior of the family. So again, we see this with God the Father and Jesus Christ. God the Father has all of these children that he wants to save. How does he do that? He selects a birthright son, Jesus Christ. And how does he select that son? Who was the son who was the most submissive, who was the greatest of us all, who was the one who went to the father and said, Father, I don't want my plan. I want to fulfill your plan. I will obey you with exactness. And he selects Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ takes on this mission and this responsibility to save all of his brothers and sisters. That's you and I. Now, it's not just God the Father's family. This is the pattern for all righteous families. Abraham and Isaac. Abraham has a covenant. He has a mission. He passes it to Isaac, and Isaac helps his brother Ishmael. Isaac and Jacob, same thing. Now, Isaac's the father, and Jacob is his son, and Jacob helps Esau. Then when Jacob is the father, he chooses Joseph. And what does Joseph of Egypt do? He helps all of his other 11 brothers, right? Benjamin, Judah, Levi, Simeon, and he lays down his life for them. He suffers. He's sold into slavery, but he ultimately, he saves the family, both spiritually and temporally. 
We also see this with Lehi and Nephi, right? Um, as Brigham Young said, usually it's the eldest son, but if the eldest son is not righteous enough to do it, another son is selected. And of course, we see this with Lehi and Nephi, where Nephi is chosen not to be some pompous ruler, you know, over all of his brothers, but he's chosen as the ruler because he is the one who will fulfill the mission of his father. He is the one who is submissive, who understands what his father is trying to achieve and is ready to help unite the family, unite his brothers and sisters to come to that mission with the father. The birthright sons are the ones with the responsibility to protect, to care for, to provide, to lay down their life for their brothers and sisters and help bring them to their dad. So Joseph of Egypt is made the ruler over his brethren, right? And he's given this coat that really represents his right to rule. The Bible calls it the coat of many colors. But that's more of a mistranslation. If you actually go into ancient Jewish legends, uh, there are traditions that say, actually, this coat was more a royal and priestly coat of skins that came down from Adam. It was passed down through the ages, through the patriarchs. Sometimes it's called the coat of many markings. As Latter-day Saints, if you go to the temple, you will recognize the robe in the temple, it's part of the garment of the holy priesthood. So Joseph is essentially being given the priesthood, he's been given his endowment, and he's been given the right to rule to help save his brothers and sisters. But the problem is, his brothers and sisters don't want to hear him. They don't care. And so you know what they do? They throw Joseph of Egypt out. Worse than that, they sell him into slavery. They reject him and they sell him as a slave off to Egypt. He goes to Egypt, he suffers. But what does he do? That suffering actually enables him to save the family. And Jacob says this to his son in JST Genesis 48. He says, Oh, my son, God has blessed me in raising thee up to be a servant unto me in saving my house from death. In other words, Jacob is looking at his son and saying, My son, you helped me be able to achieve this mission and you saved your brothers and sisters. You saved this house from being destroyed. This was not just a story and a dynamic for Joseph of Egypt in his day, but every one of his descendants, that birthright was passed on to them, and they were given a responsibility to save their brothers and sisters in the house of Israel, the tribes of Judah, the tribes of Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Benjamin, Levi, Simeon. His children forever have a responsibility to save Israel. Israel. They're Israel's saviors. You can read about this in the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 48 and 50. It is powerful. It is very important to study so you can understand how the covenant of Israel is operating. And Joseph specifically passes it to his birthright son, who is Ephraim. This is why it is Ephraim, who is the son and the tribe that is responsible for taking the gospel to the world, for carrying the burden of having to gather the family of Israel and saving them. If you read in Ether 13, it talks specifically about, yes, it is Joseph's tribe who is responsible to build Zion. It is their responsibility to carry on the priesthood and the gathering. And why? Because this goes all the way back to their fathers, our fathers as members of the tribe of Ephraim, who were given that responsibility as the birthright, as the ones carrying that covenant responsibility to protect and care for and lay our lives down for our brothers and sisters in the family. Now, as a side, if you go into the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 48, there is another bit of an aspect in this where Jacob is talking to Joseph and he talks about how Ephraim and Manasseh were actually adopted by Jacob. They were taken into Jacob's family as his own. He says, they are mine. They will be called after my name. They were called Israel. And Jacob tells Joseph, thy issue which thou begettest after them shall be thine, shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance in the tribes. Therefore, they were called the tribes of Manasseh and of Ephraim. Essentially, Jacob is revealing here that Joseph had other children and that those children were kind of hidden. Their identity was kind of just folded under Ephraim and Manasseh. They were just kind of, okay, you're part of Ephraim's group, you're part of Manasseh's group, but they actually had 
uh, this other bloodline and this responsibility, and they were preserved under Joseph's covenant, according to JST Genesis 48. And the reason why this is important is because if you continue reading that section, he talks about these children and he says that they are raised up to be a servant to save the house of Israel, just as Joseph saved the house of Israel in his day and delivered them from famine. And Jacob says, these children will be blessed above thy brethren and above thy father's house, above the house of Israel. And not just so that they can be, oh, we're better than everybody else, but because they have a responsibility to be a light unto the people of Israel to deliver them from captivity and to bring salvation unto them. Jacob actually says that the children of Israel, the house of Israel will bow to these Josephite birthright sons from generation to generation forever. Again, not in this prideful, arrogant sense of royalty, but the sense of noblesse oblige, right? That nobility has this obligation to care for those under them, to deliver them from captivity, to be a light to them, to bring salvation unto them. So when we talk about Ephraim and we talk about Ephraim's responsibility to gather Israel, this goes back to Ephraim being not only the birthright son of Joseph, but also having within his family these other Josephite children as well. And the problem is we don't know a whole lot about this more. Uh, We're very grateful to Joseph Smith for giving us the JST so we even know what we do, that these lineages even exist. Um, But as far as the Bible, the Bible loses the story here. The story of the Bible is written from the perspective of Judah, the story of Israel in the old world. And so they lose the story here of Joseph. What what happened to Joseph? What happened to these birthright sons of Israel? And what's their role? It is in the Bible. It's in Ezekiel. It's in the book of Isaiah. But it's really missing in clarity. Enter Mormon and the Book of Mormon. Now it's time to bring the Book of Mormon into this. So what happened to Joseph's birthright? If you remember from Judah's perspective, as a people, they always struggled. And we're talking about this covenant of Enoch and the everlasting covenant. The children of Judah and the children of Israel in the old world, they always struggled. They were always kind of trying to work towards this goal. But as a people, they never achieved what the fathers had. (laughs) The family is broken. And eventually, Judah's completely separated from the tribe of Ephraim in, in the big rebellion. And the family really is broken. And that's because the birthright to help get the house of Israel back to this covenant of the fathers, back to this covenant of Enoch to be able to enjoy the blessings of the everlasting covenant comes through Joseph. So where did Joseph go? Where where are these birthright sons? Where's the birthright? And so that Judah and the rest of the tribes of Israel even know who to go to to be able to be united as a family once again, because right now the family is broken, completely broken. Well, That's why the Book of Mormon is so critical. If you go into the Book of Mormon, you understand right at the very beginning that the birthright of Joseph began to be passed to Lehi. This is why Lehi is ecstatic when he gets the brass plates and he finds his lineage, the lineage of the patriarchal fathers of Joseph recorded on the brass plates. The brass plates were essentially the record of Joseph and the record of these covenants and the record of the birthright sons. Lehi finds it. He realizes, oh my goodness, this is me. And like Abraham, he looks back. He's like, I want this. I want to achieve what Joseph of Egypt achieved. And he fights for it and he gets it. He is able to inherit the land of America. This is a big deal. So when you read Lehi in the Book of Mormon saying, you know, I have obtained a land of promise and and all of these things. And we're like, oh, that's so nice for Lehi. This is a big deal. Lehi is carrying on the birthright of Joseph, which includes not just blessings, but a very heavy responsibility for saving the rest of the house of Israel around the world. Think about it. This is why when Nephi goes and sees the vision of the tree of life, What does he see? He sees the history of Israel scattered all over around the world. Why is Nephi seeing this? Why, what does it have to do with him? Why does it relate to him? 
because he is the birthright son of Lehi. He's going to carry on this birthright of Joseph to the next generation. Now, does it make sense why Mormon is very proud when he says, I'm a pure descendant of Lehi and I am a descendant of Nephi? Because what is he saying? He's saying, I'm carrying on this birthright of Joseph and that's why I'm writing the Book of Mormon. Now, before we just go a step further into Mormon, we just need to clarify one thing about Lehi's lineage and the lineage of the people of Lehi. There's a passage in the Book of Mormon where Lehi is identified as a descendant of Manasseh. And unfortunately, that one passage has led to everyone assuming that Lehi was only Manasseh. It's this wild hair that we just isolate that one passage out of context. We don't read the rest of the scriptures. And so people always are like, well, Lehi didn't have anything to do with Ephraim or Judah or whatever. Uh, he was just Manasseh. This isn't true. So we read from Joseph Smith that Lehi was of Manasseh, but his children married into the family of Ishmael. And Ishmael was of the lineage of Ephraim. So what does that mean? All of Nephi's children were of the birthright line of Joseph of Egypt. Mormon is an Ephraimite. This makes sense now why Mormon is writing the stick of Ephraim and why his son Moroni has the keys of the stick of Ephraim. They're carrying that blood lineage. Also, if you think about that passage in the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 48 that says that Joseph of Egypt had other birthright sons who carried on the covenant and they were kind of hidden or kind of sandwiched under Ephraim and Manasseh, it kind of raises some questions in our minds also of, well, okay, we have Lehi labeled as Manasseh, but does that mean he was just Manasseh or does he also have this bloodline from some of these other birthright sons of Joseph? There's a lot we don't know. So we have to be careful before we jump to assumptions, but we do know for a fact for sure that Lehi's family was Ephraim and Manasseh and we also know that when Mulet came into the picture, he brought the tribe of Judah. So the Nephite population is definitely Manasseh, Ephraim, and Judah. Also, we should be careful to note that when we say, oh, Lehi was a descendant of Manasseh, that doesn't mean he was only a descendant of Manasseh. He could have had a lot of the tribes of Israel, actually. He could have had Levi. He could have had, we don't know. Uh, just because he had Manasseh's blood doesn't mean he was 100% only Manasseh. So we just have to be careful before we go into uh, some of these assumptions. What we do know is that Lehi carried on the birthright of Joseph of Egypt and that he was given the inheritance of the everlasting covenant. He obtained the blessings of Enoch, that he passed that to Nephi and Nephi inherited those and they were passed from father to son through the Nephite forefathers to Mormon. The Nephite forefathers are not just Nephites. They are the birthright fathers of the house of Israel with the responsibility to not just carry on that birthright, but to save their brothers and sisters in the house of Israel. This is why everyone who repents, according to 1 Nephi 14, is numbered in Lehi's family, just as those who want to be adopted into Abraham's family can come into the seed of Abraham and can come into the house of Israel. Everyone who repents in the last days and is willing to come into the covenant is numbered in Lehi's family. This is 1 Nephi 14 verses 1 through 2. If the Gentiles shall hearken unto the Lamb of God in that day, that he shall manifest himself unto them in word, also in power and very deed, unto the taking away of their stumbling blocks, if they will harden not their hearts against the Lamb of God, they shall be numbered among the seed of thy father. This is the Lord speaking to Nephi, of course, so thy father is Lehi, and they shall be numbered among the house of Israel. In other words, in the last days to come into the covenant, you not only are part of Israel, but you're part of Lehi. Why? Because Lehi is carrying on the birthright of Joseph, and Joseph is the birthright brother, the birthright tribe to save the family. So Lehi comes to America, he goes to work, he establishes a nation, and it works. Have you thought about this? The Nephites actually achieved that city of peace, that civilization of operating under God's laws, living in a Zion-like society. Yes, they eventually fell away and they were destroyed, but for over 200 years, they succeeded. They actually achieved the goal that the house of Israel had been struggling to try to achieve for hundreds of 
even thousands of years and never did. The House of Israel in the old world never succeeded. They never got there. The Nephites did. The Nephite forefathers won. They got it to work. Now here's Mormon at the end of the Nephite civilization sitting here surrounded by wagon loads and wagon loads of records. And he knows the history. He knows the bloodline. And he knows what's going to happen in the last days. And he knows that he and his forefathers have this responsibility of saving Israel, that they are Joseph. They're carrying this responsibility and this covenant, but it's all going to be lost and it's all going to be destroyed. So he sits down and he writes a book, a book to tell Israel, his brothers and sisters in the last days, how to gather together, to speak to them from the dust, saying, I'm one of your fathers. I know how to get back to God. I'll tell you guys how to do it if you will listen to me. Mormon is the birthright son of Joseph trying to save the family hundreds and hundreds of years after he's died. And now if you go in and you read the Book of Mormon, you read Mormon's words, you can feel the anxiety and you can feel the hope and also the responsibility and authority that he feels with this mission. How do we keep this covenant going? I'm responsible to save this family. How do we do this? And in perfect order, because Mormon is a righteous patriarchal father, he doesn't do this alone. He has a son and he passes that responsibility to his son Moroni. They're a father and son team together to finish this mission, to produce a book that will bring the family of Israel, the brothers and sisters back together again, whether they're Gad, Asher, Naphtali, or Judah, or Ephraim, or Joseph, or Manasseh. It's time for the birthright brother to say, guys, let's come back together. Let's unite. Let's put aside our differences. Let's put aside this fighting. Let's remember who the God of Israel is. Let's follow him and let's become a family again. The Book of Mormon is the book to save the brothers and sisters. If you're a Jew, you need your birthright brother to come and help you get back to God. If you're Gad, Asher, Naphtali, you need the birthright brother of Joseph to come and help you. If if you are of Ephraim, you still need the leader of this birthright, the Nephite forefathers, Joseph of Egypt, and now Joseph Smith in our day as well, to pave this way to say, this is how we build Zion. We did it. We succeeded. Now you can do it too. And we'll show you how. Instead of being divided, let's come together and let's do this. Israel in the Old Testament never succeeded. They never got to achieve it. But the Nephite Josephites did. This is why when Joseph Smith began sending missionaries and converting some members of the tribe of Judah, he told them, when you gather, gather to America. A lot of people don't know about this because they think of just the old world as the home of Judah. But Joseph Smith actually received a letter from Orson Hyde, who was in New Jersey, and he was getting ready to leave on a mission. And he was asking to know if converted Jews are to go to Jerusalem or to come to Zion in America. And Joseph Smith says, I therefore wish to inform him that converted Jews must come here. Why would they be coming to the land of Joseph? Because Joseph has the responsibility as the birthright brother to bring the family together, to get them trained, and then help reestablish them in their covenant lands elsewhere. So the Book of Mormon unites the family. Mormon is this voice of the fathers crying out and pleading with us. This is how to do it. I will tell you how. Mormon is bringing the family back together again through the Book of Mormon, saying, All of you are a part of this. Do you want what Abraham dreamed of? Do you want to find what Enoch was building? I know how. Mormon knows how. He's like, I will help you get there. And he's writing the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon is the manual. It's the instructions to not only learn who Jesus Christ is, but to learn everything that comes with that. The covenants and the instructions for how to gather Israel who they are, and how to rebuild as a nation and gather just as Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 37, the dead dry bones just laying out in the valley, how to bring them together, not just as a people, but actually to breathe life into them, to bring hope. Again, this happens when what? The stick of Joseph and the stick of Judah come together. In other words, until you connect why the Book of Mormon matters and that the Book of Mormon is this record of Joseph and what Joseph has to do with the Bible and the covenant, the birthright brother that was trying to save the family, 
they're disconnected and you don't understand how they work. But if we look back to these fathers, suddenly everything will fall into place. We'll know exactly what to do and who to go to for the answers. This is why when Moroni came to Joseph Smith, the very first time when he announces to him and says, hey, there's this record and we need you to translate it and gives him this assignment, he actually quotes Malachi about what? Turning the hearts of the children to the fathers. He says, plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming, end quote. In other words, if this does not happen, if we do not understand why the Book of Mormon matters, why the Book of Mormon fathers are important to us, our relation to them, their responsibility over us, and if we don't listen to them and turn our hearts to them, everything is going to be destroyed. There will be nothing left. And when Jesus Christ comes back, it, the earth will be utterly wasted. But the Book of Mormon has that message of hope and how to do it. This is why right at the title page of the Book of Mormon, it says, what is the purpose of the Book of Mormon? Or one of the purposes. It is to show the remnant of the house of Israel, right? Show all the brothers and sisters what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers. Their fathers, right? The Nephite fathers are their fathers too. Why? Because the Nephite fathers are those fathers of Joseph, that they may know the covenants of the Lord, that they are not cast off forever. In other words, these Nephite, Josephite fathers are speaking to all of us, no matter where you come from, Cambodia, Argentina, Russia, China, the Middle East, uh, Guatemala, Canada, Alaska, no matter where you come from. If you are of the house of Israel, this message is for you. And you have a big, these big brothers, in a sense, calling out to you and saying, we're responsible for saving you and protecting you and caring for you. Will you listen to us? Because we have something to say. You are not cast off. There are promises for you. Come, turn your hearts to us and we will help you get back to who you really are, your real identity. This is why Joseph of Egypt was prophesying about the Nephites hundreds and hundreds of years before they were even born. In 2 Nephi 4, it says, Joseph of Egypt truly prophesied concerning all his seed and the prophecies which he wrote, there are not many greater. He prophesied concerning us, the Nephites, and our future generations, and they are written upon the plates of brass, end quote. Now, I'm probably becoming a broken record here, but this is just critical now, when you go read the book of Mosiah, when you open up those chapters, you're beginning Mormon's abridgment. You are literally reading the words of your birthright brother calling out to you and saying, this is how you find God. Where does the house of Israel find God in the last days? What is their tool for conversion? The book of Mormon. We say this all the time. The book of Mormon will gather Israel. The book of Mormon is the, the key to conversion. Why? right? We're disconnecting why it is. How does it have that power? Because it brings the family together. This is why it is the Book of Mormon, the Nephi prophets who bring us nearer to God than any other book, because that is their job. That is their covenant responsibility as the birthright brother to bring us back to the father. That's the job of the birthright son. And they are going to save the house of Israel through the Book of Mormon, both individually at an individual salvation level, but also politically, internationally. That's why there's political government principles in the Book of Mormon, because saving their family is not just a spiritual thing. It's also a very temporal thing, just as it was for Joseph of Egypt when he saved his family from famine. So now when we come to Mormon, I hope you look at Mormon a little differently because he is not just a prophet. He's not just this man given this mission to create this abridgment. But as he says, he says, I'm a descendant of Nephi. I am pure from Lehi. I am the father writing this book. He's going back through all of these records. Think about what Mormon is doing. He's going through all the records of the fathers. He's going through all of these Nephite birthright forefathers. And he's saying, okay, how do I put together a plain, simple, clear manual for us to know how to build Zion. 
And he's not just, oh, okay, let's just quote Alma here or Nephi here, but he's writing it very carefully, trying to comment on and explain things, help it to be simple and understandable for us. If you think about Mormon's mission, Mormon is trying to bring us back and restore us from being the dead bones of Israel, like Ezekiel said, Um, just the dry, dead, desolate, uh, wandering state that we're in throughout the world. And he's trying to restore us back together, resurrect us as a people. This literally is put in his name. Um, There's a statement from Joseph Smith. It's believed to be from Joseph Smith, where he says that the name Mormon means more good. But To add a deeper level on what that means, what does more good mean? If you actually go into the Book of Mormon, Mormon says that he was named after the land where the church was restored back into the covenant after it had fallen away in transgression. Of course, he's referring to the church established under Alma. The people were in an apostate state. They had killed Abinadi. They're lost. And they're brought back in this place called Mormon. They're brought back into the covenant. They're brought back together as a people and they're reborn. They're given new life. And that's Mormon's name. Very, very appropriate because what is his mission? To literally take lost, fallen, apostate, Gentile Israel and help them receive new life and new hope. Is this not us today? Is this not Israel? We have rejected God, huh? but we can be restored. And that's literally what Mormon's name means, to bring back that more good, to come back into the covenant. This is the purpose of the Book of Mormon, as stated in 3 Nephi chapter 21, verse 22. If they will repent and hearken unto my words and harden not their hearts, I will establish my church among them. They shall come in unto the covenant, be numbered among this, the remnant of Jacob, unto whom I have given this land for their inheritance. In other words, if we will repent, the birthright brother, the remnant of Joseph, will bring us back together as a people once again. And that is Mormon's mission. This is why we should take issue when there are progressive voices in our day that are attacking Mormon, attacking his character, attacking his credibility, and attacking his wisdom in writing the Book of Mormon. Mormon is our father. He is trying to help bring us to Jesus Christ. He came into Jesus Christ's presence. And now he, with the Nephi prophets, want to show us how. If you read 2 Nephi 3, Mormon is one of the greatest kings and fathers in the history of the earth. (laughs) He not only wrote the Book of Mormon for us today, but also the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon that will literally be our scripture during the millennium to teach us even then, even after Zion is built, we will still be looking back to Mormon. That is who Mormon is. That is how great that he was. Mormon is trying to give us the words and the instructions to build Zion. Yes, The Book of Mormon is sifted through Mormon's lens, his perspective, it's his approach, his thoughts, his opinions, his commentary. So if he was bad, if he was biased, if he was a murderer, if he was not a man of pure character, yes, the Book of Mormon is tainted. But the Book of Mormon is not tainted. Mormon knew what he was doing and he has wisdom for us if we will be humble and we will turn our hearts and say, okay, Mormon, you know how to get back to Jesus Christ. I'm ready to listen. I'm ready to turn my heart as a child back to the fathers. And I'm ready to listen once again to be restored as a people. We have a divine promise from the Lord that when Israel will turn to these fathers, specifically the Book of Mormon fathers, to learn their covenants, and when they learn of these covenants and are reunited with their fathers, They will be gathered and they will be protected. This is the message that I began receiving just just a small glimpse of in uh, 2022 when I was reading Ezekiel 37. I didn't understand at all really what I was reading. It took many, many, many months and over a year of pondering and praying and just continuing to ask myself this question, What does it mean to unite the stick of Joseph and the stick of Judah together? How do we do this when the light bulb suddenly went on for me? 
if we unite the story, if we unite the Nephite forefathers with the birthright of Joseph and the implications that that has for the biblical covenant and the biblical record, and then we gather the family back together, they will be resurrected as an army and they will be saved. If we do not do this, if we do not choose to turn our hearts to the fathers, we will be out of order and there will be no protection. This is the pleading of these prophets. Mormon, in the words of Mormon, uh, verse 11, he says, I, Mormon, pray to God that these writings may be preserved from this time henceforth. He says, I know that they will be preserved, for there are great things written upon them, out of which my people and their brethren shall be judged at the great and last day, according to the word of God, which is written, end quote. You and I will both be judged according to what is written in the Book of Mormon. Later, Moroni, Mormon's son, says he will be there at the judgment seat. He will be standing there looking you in the eye, telling you, I told you the way. I paved the way for you. My father and I together preserved this record so that you knew where to look to to be saved. So you knew who Jesus Christ was, so that you knew what the covenants were. And we are your fathers. We laid down our lives for you. What did you do with that promise? This is in Moroni chapter 10, verses 27, where he says, The time speedily cometh that you shall know that I lie not. Ye shall see me at the bar of God. And the Lord God will say unto you, Did I not declare my words unto you, which were written by this man, like as one crying from the dead, even as one speaking out of the dust? End quote. Personally, I am recommitted with my entire heart to care about Mormon, to listen to him, to submit to his teachings and instruction, to open this book and say, okay, dad, tell us how to do this. I'm finally ready to listen. Mormon has the way outlined for us. So let's start with Mormon's story for us. Let's open up this book together. This book that was given to us by a very righteous father and king in an eternal sense. This book that will help us as a family to be united again, to put aside our differences, to cast off this very wicked culture that we were born into, to put aside our false traditions, to come together and find new life and healing and be resurrected as an army of Israel in the last days so that we can build Zion and that we can come back to the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. <laughs>